Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 211 of the Team House. I'm Jack Murphy here with David Park. And our guest on today's show is Nelson Miller. Nelson served in uh, the Navy as a SEAL, including with uh, Development Group, and today runs uh, the Trident Grill out in Tucson. Four, four, four or of, five of them now. Five. Yeah. Five, five of them. Um, yep. So, uh, you know, we're really happy to have you on the show today, Nelson. Thank you for joining us uh, in the middle, in the midst of your uh, vacation. Well, thanks for having me, and I. I really appreciate your patience. I know I agreed to do this some time ago and then the date came upon us and I had forgotten and I was overseas and here I am now. Thank you for joining me in my little Vegas hotel room <laughs> and uh, quite the motivational intro you guys have there. <laughs> I, hadn't seen, I hadn't seen that before. Yeah, it's uh it's kind of a signature at this point in time. Yeah, absolutely. It's so cheesy that people love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, no. Thank you guys for your patience again, and I look forward to the conversation. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, Nelson, like, uh, one of the things we always want to know is, what's your origin story? How did you grow up, and what took you to the military to begin with? It's not complicated. I grew up in Maryland, a, a typical mother father relationship one younger brother um outside of dc and uh, ev everything was pretty normal middle class my dad was a police officer they got divorced when i was fairly young she got remarried my mom was you know she did a lot of jobs but she mostly took care of my brother and i but school wasn't my thing so didn't really play sports and i would skip school whenever possible i just <laughs> didn't find it interesting i worked construction or fast food and then uh, graduated in 83. And in those years, the recruiters were very um, deliberate or engaging. So I was getting a lot of calls from them. They had quotas to meet. So I was the perfect candidate, you know, barely graduated high school, was not going to college. So the Navy recruiter caught my interest for some reason because I was always into aviation and bombs. And he offered me this aviation ordinance man job, whatever, loading bombs on airplanes that sounded pretty neat. So I, I told him I would consider it. And then he's like, come in and take a physical. It's good for two years. And it was a Friday. And literally, next thing I knew, knew I, my hand was up and there was a big picture of Ronald Reagan behind me. And that Monday, I left for boot camp. So Friday, I joined. I left on Monday. While in boot camp, I got my uh, welcome to delayed entry program paperwork from the Navy. And I should have known right then that the Navy might not be the best choice in the world. But it worked out wonderfully, so no complaints. So that, that's pretty much it as far as growing up. Um, like I said, zero to complain about. It was a wonderful childhood. Yeah. What, uh, what was it? It was just because a recruiter called. Had you considered the military at that point in time? Or there, there was nothing I wasn't considering, you know, and I looked at the different branches and I, I just didn't have much interest. I was enjoying not being in school anymore and just working full time construction. And like I said, at a fast food restaurant at night. So I wasn't going anywhere. College was not on the radar. So they kept calling and calling and calling. Again, it was a different time there in the mid 80s. And uh, next thing I know, boot camp in Orlando. So how did you take to that to the, the uh, weapons ordinance position and, and that the Navy had for you? That worked out super well. And uh, again, back in the 80s, SEAL teams weren't nearly as known as they are now. I mean, and that's that's not even doesn't do it any justice. They weren't. I was mm -hmm. in the Navy and I had never heard of Navy SEALs. So I finished boot camp, which was a complete waste of time. And then I went to AOA school in Millington, Tennessee. And somehow and it's one of those remarkable stories when you look back and you think how many little tangents in life had it gone the other way you would ended up in a different right. position but mm -hmm. i think there was 36 of us in a class somewhere along there and i i finished i don't know how number one in my class of aoa school so you had your choice of orders and they put all the orders out on the table and you go from the number one finisher to the last picking orders but there was one set of orders for 
it was a helicopter squadron out of North Island doing anti-submarine warfare. And it was shore duty. And every other set of orders for, was from for some carrier somewhere in the fleet mm -hmm. as an E3 carrier. I don't know what you guys know about that, but as I've learned, it's not the best life in the world. So picking first, I took that shore duty in North Island. Um, subsequently, it was a great job. I mean, it, it was super easy work loading torpedoes every now and then. It was not much. So I was able to work out a lot, went to school a little bit at night. And at a bar locally, I met some SEALs and I couldn't believe they were in the Navy, but they were. And they're like, yeah, you should give it a shot. So I volunteered for BUDS and then off I went. What? But had I finished second or 27th in that class, I, I probably wouldn't be sitting in this hotel room in Vegas right now. Or I would, but it would be an entirely different story. <laughs> what was it about the SEALs when you met them that you're like, I can't believe they're in the Navy. And then what was it about? you know, them or what they told you that made you think, yeah, I'm just going to go do this thing. They just seemed, you know, I like, I liked what I was doing at that time, but they just seemed, you know, they had the longer hair, they were in shape. They just had the attitude and the persona that I'm like, man, you know, I got to research this a little bit. Maybe this will be a direction I'd like to go. I mean, they're shooting guns and blowing things up and running on the beach. And, you know, it, it sounded a lot better than what I was doing. Not that there was anything wrong with my job, but it it definitely was life changing for me and meeting those two that night. It, you know, the rest is history, as they say. So these days, I think because there is so much information about, out there about every special operations unit that Correct. kids get in their heads about going to selection, you know, whatever that selection is like they agonize over it. They mm. research what the best way to get in shape for it was. What what was your process in, in the eighties. It was, you know, and everything you said is true, but has the graduate graduation rate increased because of all the knowledge? I don't think it has. So, you know, you cannot go to buds or any other selection course now with more information than it's out there. So, but people still go and 70% of the people still wash out. So it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty amazing. My personal thought was, you know, they have a rollback program if you get hurt or if you fail in evolution. But to me, I started every day. I found buds actually quite simple. They told you where to be, what to bring, and um, and what to do. So there was no real responsibility. You just suck it up every day, mm -hmm. and the day ends, and you start tomorrow. So my whole mantra at that time was just like, I'm not getting rolled back, and I'm certainly not quitting. So, and then next thing you know, you're you're there at graduation. So. Um, yeah, there were moments where I'm like, man, this is this isn't super cool. <laughs> But honestly, you know, I, it, I found it quite enjoyable just looking back. I don't know if you would ask me midstream how I was doing, right. but, but it was simply that you just can't quit and let everything fall as it will, as, yeah. as you guys know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I was working out a lot and running on the beach and trying, trying to swim and get it, you know, trying to prep myself because those guys had remained friends and they told me, yeah, you're going to get your ass kicked for a while. And they weren't <laughs> wrong, but you know, it's a volunteer program. You don't have to be there. Yeah. Yeah. And you had a decent job. So you weren't like coming from the fleet where you were miserable and like, oh, I, I cannot go back to the fleet. I can't, no, I can't tell you how, I hate to say easy, but it was pathetic <laughs> that they were paying me for the job I was doing. It was, <laughs> it was, it was really something. So no, I had it made and, you know, and I picked up some rank by the time I went to buds in 88, I was an E5 you know, still hadn't been on a Navy ship. I mean, things, things were looking pretty good for the old man. But, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I still accepted the orders to buds and off I went. So, yeah. And yeah. so when you got out of buds, what was the next phase for you? Uh, right from buds, you went to airborne school in Fort Benning and then you report to your SEAL team. On my wish list, I had asked for SEAL Team 2 just because of its history from, you know, back in the day in Vietnam, it was just SEAL Team 1 and SEAL Team 2. And SEAL Team 2 was in Virginia Beach. And uh, my mom and my stepdad still had some family in Maryland, which isn't far. So I thought, you know, I didn't really like, love the West Coast lifestyle. And I heard things about East Coast SEALs versus West Coast SEALs. So I had asked for SEAL Team 2. You don't have a choice, but I got it. So went to airborne school and then reported for duty at SEAL Team 2. Uh, what for 
whether they were true or not, what were the things that you heard that were different between East Coast and West Coast SEALs? You know, they would probably say the same thing about East Coast guys, but, you know, the Hollywood thing with the sunglasses and calendars and, you know, beach bodies and, and being kind of shitty operators is what we would say on the East Coast. But I know if you get a West Coast guy in here tomorrow, they're going to make fun of us. So that's just, you know, the competitive rivalry that you have. Sure. And the, the two coasts definitely share that within the SEAL teams. Maybe I'm assuming it's still ongoing today. If it's not, it should be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, all these units have this sort of healthy competition between one another, whether it's between the Ranger battalions or we've even had talked about the different Delta squadrons. Yeah. Like these well, even in, in even in a Ranger battalion, because I'm sure you had this, you know, on SEAL Team Two. Even amongst that, you have the different teams, you know, and the rivalries that, or not the teams, but the different, you know, boat teams or whatever, and the rivalry Absolutely. that goes there. But, yeah, and the key word with all that is it's healthy. I yeah. mean, it, it makes you want to be better and yeah. to outperform those other platoons or those other color teams or or your sister units. So, um, no, it's a good thing. So what what did your like your mom and your stepdad like your family your friends think here here you were first you went into the navy and now you're doing this crazy thing that they probably haven't even heard of um I, did, I think I think you nailed it there you know they never heard of it so you know I did what research you could do in the the mid 80s but you know I let them know hey I'm going to buds training what's buds stand for basic underwater demolition seal what the hell is that and then, you know, so it was more of a, it was a learning experience for them as well as me. Of course, typical mom stuff, she doesn't want her son to get hurt or go to war or do anything like that. So, you know, I'm sure there were some consequences associated with, but it was very supportive. And of course, you know, looking back, you know, very proud of me personally and uh, the things accomplished along the way. Yeah. And so what year did you get to SEAL Team 2? Uh, it must have been... The early 89. Okay. And yeah. what was it like for you as as a sailor, like a seasoned sailor? You know, you had done a tour basically, and mm -hmm. now you're in this new world. It wasn't great. Uh, I would use the word shitty, actually. Like, I got to SEAL Team 2 after stupid-ass airborne jump school. And back then, you didn't, you didn't have a trident yet. You know, BUDS was just BUDS. You had to go through something called... Um, STT back in the day, day, SEAL tactical training. Now, now it's all streamlined. Buds goes to SQT right after. And when you show up at your SEAL team, you're a Trident wearing SEAL and ready to go to work. But back then you had to do whatever the SEAL team wanted you to do until the next STT class opened. And for me, it was like four months away. So you're just flat out slave labor. And hazing was a real thing back then. So at the end of the day, they'd be drinking beers and they want to beat up the new guy. So you know, it, it wasn't looking back, it was not perfect, but <laughs> I was volunteering for anything from going to help a platoon doing boat ops or they even one morning at quarters. I remember standing out front every morning at quarters at SEAL Team 2 and the XO said, uh, hey, we've got two open as a ranger school starting like next week. And I'm like, right here, like, get, me <laughs> the hell, get me the hell out of here. And uh, quarters ended and I got called to his office and got my ass chewed for being a new guy to volunteering for ranger school. And I'm like, hey, sir, there wasn't one other hand that went right. Um, they still didn't send me. So <laughs> waited, waited for STT to kick off, got through that, got my trident and then started deploying with SEAL Team 2. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of SEALs. I mean, you know, they've done their training and I don't want to say it's a cushy life because like the water is the great divider right uh yeah. it's the great equalizer but not a lot of seals just like not a lot of sf guys roger up for ranger school it it's a suck-ass school yeah 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 you know and i've i've got a ton of ranger friends out there like really close friends and i've got nothing but respect a lot of our officers seem to have gone to ranger school at some point in their careers because it just helps them career-wise because i guess it's considered a leadership school mm -hmm. so I just didn't want to be at SEAL Team 2 anymore, and Ranger School sounded better. Yeah. yeah. I, I heard that you guys sent uh, send the officers to Ranger School when they need an attitude adjustment. <laughs> I would send them all. I've never, <laughs> been, never been a giant officer guy, so um, yeah, I'm probably the wrong one to ask. So 
what was your STT like for you then? Uh, it, it was, um, it wasn't as organized as it is today. Like it was like, I think when I went through STT, SEAL Team 4 hosted it. So the next one would be SEAL Team 2. And some point along those lines, SEAL Team 8 was commissioned. So somebody would host it and they would send people from their training department. It just was a continued kick in the nuts with um, a lot of land warfare. And, you know, it, it wasn't like BUDS. It was a lot more of a gentleman's course. But, you know, there there were people that didn't make it through SCT, so therefore never got their trident. Really? But that was more of a rarity than what Buds was, of course. What, Out of curiosity, even if it wasn't a lot of guys, what was it that they would bolo in STT that would? Usually something stupid, like an accidental discharge. Okay. That was, that was a pretty big one. Um, probably the number one thing to get you thrown out would be something like that. Okay. Or just just a completely shitty attitude not being able to work with everybody else and you know things like that but we're also talking about one million moons ago so for me to come up with any stt stories would be quite the stretch yeah <laughs> but yeah. yeah yeah so it was a necessary evil i think what they're doing now with the transition from buds right to sqt to the winter warfare and military free fall and all the other things get your trident show up ready to go is is a much better program. At yeah. least I hope. It. So once you got your trident and and things really pick up at the at your platoon, um, so we're talking probably like eighty nine ninety by this point. I mean, what are you guys looking at? Liberia, Philippines, Guam. I mean, what what were what was that deployment cycle like for you? Well, back then, SEAL teams were designated. SEAL Team Two had um, Europe. The Mediterranean, Mediterranean was shared with SEAL Team 8 when they came online and SEAL Team 4 at South America. So it was just, it was very geographically designed where you're going to deploy to. So we had a, a detachment full-time in Macrohanish, Scotland at the time. Uh, now I think it's in Germany, maybe Stuttgart. But at the time, we would keep a, a six-month deployment to Macrohanish. And then from there, you would go to the variety of countries in the region and train with them. Um as far as things picking up, you know, when I was in SEAL Team 2, the Bosnia thing, there were some things going on in that region, but there really, really wasn't much. It uh, was training. Training with a side of training. Yeah. And then 90, 91, the first Gulf War, right? Correct. Did deploy for that, sat on a ship. That, what was his name? Schwarzkopf, I think, mm -hmm. was the main at yeah. that time. Yeah. He he didn't have a lo lot of love for Navy SEALs, so we... <laughs> I know some of my West Coast friends did get involved in some things, but I think it was pretty minimal. And I can only personally say, having deployed for it, I didn't do shit. Um, <laughs> but I sat on a ship for a very long time. Uh, and it, it was okay. Uh, I wish we would have been used in some capacity, but I can't do anything about that. Yeah. And so yeah. so then after that, what what uh, what happened and what sort of where did your career take you with that? Well, I knew some friends at that time uh, that were in Naval Special Warfare Development Group, and I knew what it took to head that direction. But, you know, I was always the guy like I didn't think I wasn't ready for it. It's just think thought I owed SEAL Team 2 more. So I did three deployments, I had two and a half deployments with SEAL Team 2 or something like that before I finally uh, screened and got accepted to go to Green Team, which is another selection course for Naval Special Warfare Development Group. And that was in 95 when I made the transition from SEAL Team 2 down that way. So you were you had been in the SEAL teams for, what, about about five years up at that point in time? Yeah, I think it was six six years six. in SEAL Team 2 before I, yeah. Yep. Was that an average amount of time at that time to go to Green Team, or was that kind of early? I think at that time it was pretty average. Okay. They wanted to complete at least two six-month deployments, you know, they pass your picture around their team room and, you know, you get a thumbs up or a thumbs down from guys that may have deployed with you. It was kind of a, like a, a brotherhood, like, you know, you know, the deal, like the star chamber would be like Nelson Miller, piece of shit. You know, we don't want him type of thing. Um, subsequently, since 9-11, I know their requirements, like I don't think they require two full six month deployments anymore before you're eligible to screen. I think it's you just need to be a a pipe hitting hard charging dude. And they're going to bring you across the street down there. But for me, it was six years and then it went to green team and then stayed there for the last 10 years of my career. 
Dave, you want to give a shout out to uh, our uh, friend, a uh, friend of the show? Yes. Uh, so our sponsor tonight and a friend of the show, um, and if you haven't watched this episode, go watch 201. Dustin Ward has this awesome company called The Slight Sleeper. Now, what is the greatest piece of military kit ever created? This right here. The Whoopi. DARPA has not come up with anything better than this. The Whoopi is the only piece of military <laughs> kit the dudes will actually, like, well, they'll try and steal everything. But the, <laughs> but the Whoopi is the only piece of kit that actually ever did what it was supposed to do. Um, <laughs> and uh, Dustin had this great idea to take the Whoopi and inject it with steroids so that when you go out with his light sleeper, you can put your sleep mat. Now, for anybody who's ever been camping or had to sleep on somebody's floor and had an air mattress or like the little air mat or whatever, it doesn't stay in place. You roll off of it, whatever. But you can fit it right into this. Uh, you put a pillow in here. It, you know, secures with the normal means of, of lashing so it can still connect to a poncho. Doesn't snap, doesn't have snaps, so you don't have to worry about freezing, things like that. This alone will protect you down to like 40 degrees, right? Um, I cannot recommend yeah. this piece of gear enough. Um, and it, 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 like uh, Dave was saying, I mean, this is great for like the ultralight, ultralight backpackers out there. And I mean, it, I think it's it's cheap too. I mean, he's he's selling it for like what seventy bucks or something. Seventy like bucks that. and ten percent off when you use the promo code Team House during your checkout. It's two point one pounds. It fits into this nice little, you know, uh, snug pack. Um, this is quite possibly one of the greatest inventions so ever. Check out the lightsleeper.com slash team house, or you can just use the team house uh, or use team house as the promo code. You'll get 10% off your first order. Please, uh, you know, Real it's quick, a great it's that's a, the and it's L I T E light sleeper.com promo code team. House. It's a it's a great product and uh, it's great to help out Dustin, who's a uh, former ranger and now entrepreneur. Yes, so Nelson, um. I'd love to ask you, you know, so about this time frame. I guess now we're sort of getting into the mid '90s. Uh, what it was like going through Green Team, going through the training, and like, what what was your perception of Development Group at that time? I mean, I mean, you might, uh, well, you could fill in the blank. I mean, what what your perception was of the unit and what what they were doing at that time? Sure. One thing that piece of kit you just showed looks super cool. I like that a lot, and I wrote it down. The other thing, as far as military guys stealing from each other, the Rangers are the absolute worst when it comes <laughs> to that. Oh, yeah. I think, I think I literally put a bag of feces next to the office one time just to see if the Rangers would steal it, and they did. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> I, I have no doubt about it. Roaches. They're roaches, but I love them. <laughs> as, as far as dev group, you know, I knew what I was getting into because I had a lot of friends that had made that tra transition in the years previously, and it, it just – Sounded like where I wanted to be. Like, I think if you play baseball, you want to play in the major leagues, right? Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with the SEAL teams. And it, it sounds disparaging to say otherwise, but they were, in my eyes, the best of the best. So I wanted to challenge myself and off to green team I went once they said, yeah, let's bring Nelson over. So um, the training itself was intense, um, mostly close quarter battle type stuff, house you know, house runs, things like that. But it was physically intense and, and very um, mentally and emotionally draining as well. So uh, there's some guys, again, that did not make it through green team and they go back to the regular SEAL teams and have a great career and, you know, kudos to them. But the only thing I can say after spending 10 years at that specific command is I wish I had gone earlier. I mean, just the way it's funded and their operational capacity is just exactly what I was looking for and thoroughly enjoyed working there and the professionals that I worked with. So yeah. it, was, it was a pretty good experience. Yeah, there were some times that I questioned it. But, uh, <laughs> I, ne I never questioned the men around me. Yeah. What what was, at the time, the difference in, in you know, without going into sort of OPSEC, but sort of what was the difference between, like, a vanilla SEAL team or the, the SEALs and, and, you know, dev group? Um, 
I just think we were the responsibility bestowed to the individual was much higher. OK, like at, at SEAL team two, there was just levels of bureaucracy. And, and I'm assuming the, the other SEAL teams are like that. But a dev group, you were given a lot of rope. And if you choose to hang yourself, then knock yourself, you know, you're free to do so. But they gave a lot of responsibility to young men with automatic rifles and the rest of it. So I, and I really appreciated that. It was a, just a chance to, you know, push the limits for uh, on personal levels and then as a cohesive group. So it, it was a wonderful place to be. And uh, yeah, if that answers that. Yeah. It, 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 like. Well, in terms of like mission sets, because people, you know, tend to think of SEALs as, you know, uh, and I think their mission has changed quite a bit over the years, but tend to think of them as these commandos and, you know, uh, which, which they are, but what is different between like a vanilla seal or what a vanilla seal might be asked to do at the time and what dev group might be asked to do? Yeah. There's only a couple commands out there that literally work counterterrorism type stuff. And again, not getting into the OPSEC side of it, dev group is one of those commands. So it's a completely different, you know, structure as far as who you answer to and who calls you and tells you to go like it, that, that, in itself is pretty ginormous. So, you know, us and our sister unit, and I, I like the word sister there, our, <laughs> our, our army counterpoint. Uh, I mean, we talked about a healthy competitiveness and there's nothing about those two units that's not competitive. And, you know, back in that day in the mid nineties, we didn't have a lot of CO admirals. So we were mm -hmm. very, mm -hmm low hanging fruit. So when we're deployed to places like Afghanistan or Iraq and other things, both units are there at the same time and mission X pops up, you know, the joint chiefs and the rest of those clowns, Hey, send our army guys, you know? So we're sitting there, you know, with our thumbs up our butts, like, you know, maybe one day they'll call us, but you know, some things work out for the best. Like they're off chasing shadows in Western Iraq. And then they're like, Oh shit, look at this Intel. We gotta, we gotta act on it right now. Well, who can we send? us and it it worked out favorably from for us a lot but uh we were the stepchildren of special operations for some time at mm -hmm. least at that level mm -hmm. but um due to a lot of really good stuff that the boys have done over the years i, th I think that's come full circle mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um what? oh go ahead jack well I, I was gonna ask you know prior to 9 11 um were you guys mostly focused on like the bosnia herzegovina that that whole mission Spent a lot of time over there where I think I might have even bought property. I mean, we were spending <laughs> a ton of time in Bosnia. And again, it was good times, but there were there were so many places you go to and things that you do that just don't make the news cycle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were very active during those times. Obviously, everything changed on 9-11, of course, and rightfully so. Are, are, are uh, there, uh, I mean, not to probe too much, but I, I am going to probe. Are there any things, any missions from that time frame that you're particularly um proud to have been a part of that like maybe didn't make the newspaper or were or not maybe so widely known because I, when I have these conversations with guys, it's always interesting to hear about, you know, like I talked to somebody just today. He was like, we did this successful embassy evacuation in yeah. um, ni like 95 or 96, but it was on like, it, it didn't even make the paper because it was during the Rodney King riots. So I always like to talk to folks like you and, and ask if, if there's things like that, that maybe went under the radar at the time. Yeah, I mean, countless. And there, there's so many things like, um, luck, luckily, I was part of the Jessica Lynch rescue mission. And obviously that made the news and the, you know, heralded and all that kind of stuff. And it was a pretty straightforward thing. And it went really well for, thank God. I mean, it, it was quite the amazing night for us. But we get restaged. And the next night they send us in for what was a pre-planned mission back when we were in the beach. And I, you know, I'm arguing to my head said, look, man, we just had a pretty long night and it went pretty well. You think we could put this pre-stage thing off for another night or whatever. And they launched us and, uh, and it turned into a bit of a shit storm and nobody will ever hear about it, but I couldn't have been more proud at that time. I was a troop chief. So I had a bunch of pipe hitters that worked for me and, and off we went, but you know, it, it's just their level of professionalism is pretty, pretty badass. And, you know, you guys never heard about it. I pretty much forgot about it. But, you know, like you said, Rodney King trumped an embassy evacuation and wherever that was. It's, it's kind of a sad state of affairs. But there were so many more things we did than Jessica Lynch. 
Um, but and it, you know they all they're all worth something. And it, yeah, it was pretty remarkable stuff. Prior to nine eleven, um, did you when you were growing up in Devgrew, because you know because you have a career there too, did you find yourself drawn to different aspects uh, or operational like? aspects of i mean did did you like the low vis stuff did you like the sniper stuff did you like the assaulter stuff like what did you find yourself drawn to i was able to go to sniper school while i was at seal team two so i came over as a qualified sniper so but because at that time i think i was an e6 when i got to damn neck i was already getting a lit well that's not senior but i never got to deploy in the snipers, I was always just part of the assault team and then picked up a boat crew, which becomes, you know, because the army couldn't understand the difference between a boat crew and a team. We started calling ourselves teams within <laughs> the SEAL team. Gets a little uh, ridiculous, actually. But so I became a team chief and then a troop chief. So I never got to actually deploy as a sniper. But as far as it's usually the needs of the assault team that you're on. So as a new guy, I'm carrying a sledgehammer and a hooligan tool and, you know, a quickie saw off the op cost for that type of stuff and building breaching charges and i got heavily into breaching for a while but air ops when also when i came from seal team two i was already a jump master and had some of those qualifications so and i loved it so i kind of fell into the air operations if i had to pick one thing and and i did a lot of that which led me again to tucson arizona because i wasn't big into taking leave so if there was a period where you know leave was authorized or guys were taking leave but another assault team or somebody was out in Tucson training, I would just go out there and help, whether it's tandems or shooting video or instructing or whatever, because I, I did enjoy the jump aspect. Um, like some of the best times literally in my life is when it's like negative 40 degrees under canopy at 22,000 feet with like eight of your best friends, like at two in the morning, you know, with the lights of Phoenix over there in Tucson. It's just wonderful, wonderful stuff. So I wasn't much into the Hollywood jumping, although I've done a little bit of that. I, I like putting the stuff on and getting out in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So air ops, I guess I could have just said air ops and we could have moved on to the next question. No, because what you said was much richer. So did you become sort of like one of the sky gods for, for your dev group? I did a lot of jumping for dev group and, uh, you know, got into the hey ho, the high altitude, high opening type stuff quite deep and we re rewrote the SOPs because we went out and practiced it. And what does it mean to jump a bundle with the assault team? How does that fall in relation to and doing a lot of that kind of stuff and testing equipment? I mean, Naval Special Warfare Development Group is a testing command. If you read their, their medal, I mean, that's what they do. So we did a lot of testing and I was dumb enough to do a lot of the, the <laughs> jump. Experimental parachutists. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we did. We did a lot of that, but it was fun. It really was. So I, you're doing all this stuff out in Tucson, and now but prior to 9/11, we should probably touch upon your uh, how you became a business owner and what you started doing out there, um, and, and talk about that a little bit. Yeah, that friend of mine was running the facility, and because of the growth, they they were going to need an assistant, and he knew I was up for retirement in 2005. So we were good friends and he was going to wait to release that job until I retired, if I did in 2005. And I was a big sports bar kind of guy. Like, you know, I didn't cook in my hotel room. We were going out every night, you know, and obviously we were traveling extensively domestically and internationally, but mostly domestically training and doing this and doing that. So I like sports. I've been known to have a beer or two every now and then. And I never really understood why at a sports bar, you just had to eat, you know, deep fried food and deep fried jalapenos. So I started looking in Tucson, uh, found a place and opened it. And when was it? August of 2001. Um, very excited. At that time, I was traveling to Tucson, probably collectively three to four months a year, you know, two weeks here, three weeks there, one week there. And I thought that would be enough to keep my finger on the pulse of the business. And a month later, 9-11 happened. So my Tucson trips got put on hold for a few years. Um, but I kept writing checks for payroll and keeping it going mm -hmm. until I could, you know, if I did retire in 2005, which I ended up doing for a long, shitty story. But and then get out there and try to write that ship a little bit. So, 
Yeah, I opened the first one in 2001. Subsequently, there's three other Trident Grills and uh, a new thing we're trying, Trident Pizza Pub, that's been open since, I think, 2019. So five restaurants, four Trident Grills, and a Trident Pizza Pub. That's amazing. So, yeah, I mean, that, you did this while you were an active duty uh, operator. I mean, you were not the type of dude. I mean, your, your feet must have barely touched the ground for uh, a few years there. We stayed pretty busy. Yeah, yeah there yeah. was... There were definitely some mistakes made, but you know you can learn from them if you if you try to. So no, I don't recommend that. I don't recommend opening a business in Tucson when you live in Virginia Beach, or you're overseas a lot. But if you want to, yeah, give me a call. I'll try to talk to you. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I find myself I ask a lot of our guests this question because it's it's an inflection point for anyone whose career strode this. Um, where were you when 9-11 happened? What, what, what was it like for you at the command that day? Ironically, I was in Tucson. I had a tandem rig on my back and getting onto the bus to drive over to the airplane when the first tower got hit. So we're like, you know, the, the word's starting to get out. We got off the bus, walked back in to see the second tower get hit. So obviously we knew, okay, you know, some shit's hit the fan. Let's see where this goes. And everything got grounded. My team chief was out there with us. He jumped, literally jumped in his rental car and started driving to Tampa to get down to, to um, SOCOM down there. Literally from Tucson, he drove straight wow. to Tampa like that day. So uh, we were stuck for a few days. It was obviously early morning. Uh, Trident wasn't open, but I had the keys. So me and the boys went to Trident, um, watched the news, and just waited for word from headquarters. So it took a few days until we could get on a flight to get back east. Mm -hmm. So that's where I was wearing a stupid tandem rig, getting on a bus. And, and when you finally get back to Tampa, I mean, are you guys, or I'm sorry, when you get back to damn neck, are you, you guys jocking up to get out the door? Are there like op boards coming down to you guys? Op boards, certainly in your, you know, your kits are always staged to be ready to go out the door in short notice. So that, that wasn't a big consideration, but some target folders and things already, you know, somehow started making our way to the team room and um, some general wanted to go over and I volunteered. So me and some other guys volunteered to do the first PSD over there with a the general. I think, I don't know where we were in Afghanistan, but so I got to go pretty early. I think the first time I was in Afghanistan was November of, zero, of 01. Uh, and I think then I deployed in the beginning of 02 under the whole advanced force operations, which I know you guys are familiar with. But it was like me and one other CEO on a Toyota truck for four months. It wasn't the best. I don't recommend that. I'd recommend opening a bar across the country <laughs> not there before doing four months of AFO for uh, Special Operations Command. I definitely recommend that. What, what but, was was that AFO for uh, Iraq? I take it. No, that was Afghanistan. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. It, it was. Uh, you know, we had our big brothers, the assault team up the street. So I think our job was to drive around and get shot at. <laughs> and then we call in the, the big boys and they would take care of business. So, yeah, it's not recommended. But again, I learned a lot. And uh, the guy I was with were still great friends. Probably the best deal I ever worked with. So, so you guys were kind of the recon by fire element. You just go out there, see what happens. And yeah, they, they didn't want to call it that, but we certainly <laughs> did. <laughs> and, there were some nights we'd go to bed. His name is Hans. And I'd be, Hans, man, did we get shot at today? And he's like, I don't think we did. And we're like, well, maybe we'll start a streak. But <laughs> it, never, it never lasted very long. Um, before, uh, we don't look at the chat very much, but I just want to say that Steve Wolf, WLFE, oh. shouted out to you, said long time. Yeah, say. man, I haven't heard that name in a minute or seven. Yeah. Please send my love. If I don't know, I'm guessing he's listening right now. You're right? sending it right now. Yep. Yeah. Rock star, Mrs. Face. So, yeah, we should get together if at all possible. So, you know, with with Afghanistan, first off, everybody's afraid. It's, it's, it's Wolf making fun of me on that chat room right now. <laughs> uh, he's trolling. Not, <laughs> not that I've seen. Um, I'm I'll sure, be very disappointed if he's not. I'm sure D will keep a keep an eye out for it though. <laughs> no, nothing yet. Just saying what's up to you. That's it. But I'm sure you'll right. you'll pick up right now. Um, <laughs> so, you know, first off, everybody's worried that Afghanistan is going to end in three months or three days. <laughs> um, everybody, I'm sure, is fighting for whatever 
raids there are, you know, uh, especially in that environment at the time. Um, did you guys have to politic at all? Like, were you guys trying to like find a mission? No, uh, we in our, again, our sister counterpoint points deployed with people we were looking for, you know, the HVTs. And that was pretty much the reason we were there. But as time progressed and that stupid ass war kept going and kept going, they started using us um, more like co even conventional forces. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I never understood it, but even towards the end of my tenure, and again, I got out in 2005, I was pretty disillusioned in what they were using that command for while we were over there. Um, Extortion 17 is a big story of, I mean, that was, they were on a QRF bird, QRF for the Rangers. And again, nothing against the Rangers, but it wasn't TF 160th. It was a Nebraska National Guard stripped out CH 47 with, you know, some of your nation's best operators on. And again, I'm not saying one life is worth more than another, but that wasn't our mission, right. you know, to be QRF or another unit in the, in the aircraft and the pilots that you have not trained with, like we did with TF-160 for so many years. Right. So that kept going that direction, even from the early days. And, you know, you never know everybody, you know, back in the day, if you were hurt, you pretended you weren't because you never knew when your beeper was going to go off and you did not want to miss whatever that was, you mm -hmm. know, now Afghanistan is going. So you're, we spent a, you know, I finished that AFO tour and then went back shortly thereafter with my squadron. And th there was a propensity to jump on whatever you could, but right. of course that's, that's dictated from higher up. You don't really get a choice. You know, you can play the devil's advocate for this or for that. You got some idiot intel guy trying to insert us like during the cover of nightness. They wanted my troop to insert in point X and move to point Y, which was only about 800 meters. But the contour lines were literally on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you guys have been to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, hey, come on. you know, this is a freaking cliff, right? Yeah. There's no way we're going to get there by by light. It's just not going to happen. But so there were so many stupid things like that going on that you just look back and you're like, man, I, you know, the fact that we're still here is quite amazing, actually. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I, don't, I don't know if I'm answering your question. You, yeah, yeah. you absolutely are. And yeah. we appreciate it. Are, okay. Now, did you guys have to change your tactics at all during that time? Because, you know, here you are one of the preeminent counterterrorist forces and, and now you're doing land patrol patrol uh you know activities 100 percent true and we learned that pretty quick you know we had our cool little cool guy 10 inch barrel guns with the suppressors on it for house clearance and no real optics to speak of other than you no know, red dot type stuff in-house shooting and now you're patrolling whatever number of hundreds of meters trying to identify good versus bad and yeah, we ended up having to put some ACOGs on our rifles. There was a big learning curve. It wasn't just, you know, clearing a, a building anymore. And from call outs, so what is the risk of force? You know, is, is it safer to have Terps talk to him and call him out or bomb the place or go in? And it, there was so much of a learning curve. And, um, you know, that's just the nature of, of combat, I guess. But we were tr we were trained pretty hard for things that were a lot different than what we saw when we got over there. Some of it, you know, angles are angles and things are things. But, you know, when it when it comes down to it's not some munition being shot at back at you, things get a little bit different, as you guys know. Yeah. Yeah. So were you did you try to do most of that in house? Did you reach out to because even like a conventional infantryman and, and the conventional side of the military has a decent grasp generally of like. The patrol base activity or patrol type activities were, were, were did you guys have people helping you along with that stuff if there were there were i never saw them yeah it was it was all you know we would debrief from the other team or whatever we'd get back and we extensive after actions reports and lessons learned and things like that so the biggest thing i think we were great out before any ops obviously you have a plan but you know the plan's going to go to shit so you just what if the bejesus out of it and that was one of our you know what's the difference between the seal teams or an sf team or rangers or some of the other units out there 
And I would always say it's just our flexibility on target. Like I've been with other units before and they're like, but we were told to do this, sir. And I'm like, dude, that's not going to work right now. And it's pretty evident that it's not because that place is on fire. We're not doing that. We're going to do this. So flexibility on target, listening to people that have been there and what they learned, especially when they're brothers and then, uh, you know, implementing that in our, the next time we go. Now you mentioned that you had a bit of disillusionment. What was, what was the general feeling of guys in the unit, you know, being trained to be the tip of the spear in this, you know, very dynamic counter terrorist role. And now they're out doing patrols. Was there, was there a lot of pushback? No guys. No, that, that, that's another thing. Once, you know, the pushback would be before you jump on the helicopters or you get in the Humvees or the Bradley fighting vehicles or whatever the insertion method is, the pushback would be prior, but once you're actually the mission, you know, you're, you're, you know, three bags full, Roger that let's go. Now, you know, especially in Iraq as a troop chief, and we had been doing a lot of work over there at the point, we, we got some dumb shit that would come across and we'd get back from this and, because of things on that target would lead to another target pretty quickly sometimes, like actionable intelligence. And I'd be talking to the head shed and they're pushing for something way over here. My guys would never see it, but I'm arguing against actually going to do that because it, to me, it didn't make sense tactically uh, or for a lot of different reasons. I, I was kind of that guy sometimes, mm -hmm. but then if they're like, you're going anyway there, dude, I would go to the boys and, you know, we'd get fired up, reload and go back out. So uh, officers, I think it comes back to officers. They they would spend two years at damn neck. Mm. So for their fitness reports, they needed to have something on it to separate it from somebody else. Right. So they're pushing for a lot more than the actual dudes going through the door. That that sounds kind of self praising, and I don't mean to be, but you know they got a two year chance to make a mark to continue their officer career, and that's always bothered me on some level. Yeah. Yeah, we've talked about that just e even in the range of battalions before where, you know, a, a PL, you know, has 18 months or whatever, whatever he has there. And he's going to, you know, ride you hard and put you away wet. So it looks good yeah. for him, but he doesn't understand that as soon as he's gone, somebody else is coming in and do the exact same and, thing. And guys like you are there for 15 yeah. years or 10 years or yeah. whatever, <laughs> slogging it out every day. Yeah. Yep. And guys that get the dev group generally do not leave. I mean, they come from SEAL Team 3 or SEAL Team whatever, and they get to damn neck, and they're there until they retire or they have to go. Yeah. And sometimes they make rank and there's no room for them, so they'll go back to the other side or maybe go out to be a BUDS instructor, which sounds absolutely horrid to me. But for the most part, they're there until they can't stay there anymore because that, you know, that's exactly right. But officers, they come and go. Um, and they I'm not saying they wouldn't go on target, and they would. But, you know, you are you clear that first room, stuff your officer in there with the EOD guys, and you go clear the rest of the, the, the building, you know? So, again, it sounds kind of shitty for me to say that, but they're trying to do what they're, what they're trying to do. They just sometimes had different goals than, like, we had. Now, what was your relationship with the Vanilla Seals during this period of time? Were you guys competing for the same operations? No, if, they, if we were, it was transparent to us. So there was very little, I can't, I can't speak of everything past my time in 2005, as far as if there was a, a working relationship, but while we were there, no, we didn't have any interaction, didn't even see them. So I know they were very busy as well, but no, no, sir, nothing with, nothing with us. Do you want to, um, I'd like to ask you about, uh, Iraq and when that starts, if you could tell us, you know, when does that start coming on your radar at this point, what your troop chief Yes. When does when does Iraq start coming up on your radar? When do you start getting prepared for that? What what's the mission going in? It it happened pretty quick. I think we had just got back from Afghanistan when that was spinning up, and uh, it was it happened to be luckily or not luckily, it was our assault team that got out the door. I think first, and uh, that was a whole different ball game than Afghanistan. Afghanistan, it was a lot of. What the hell are we trying to figure things out? I mean, it was Afghanistan. You know, Baghdad was a, a city and it kind of more what we thought we had been trained for because it was like direct action type stuff, looking for this guy, looking for that guy, trying to find a phone, trying to do this. It 
you know, to call it more fun would be just because of my lack of vocabulary, but I enjoyed it a lot more over there. It, it, it was some badass stuff. But with that was some of the same bureaucratic stupidity that we witnessed in Afghanistan just got carried on to Iraq. But uh, very proud of what the guys did in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, yeah, n nothing really negative. I just, you know, if I was king for the day, I would have done things a little <laughs> different. What did you guys have a, a role in the invasion of Iraq? Uh, we were in a little tent city early before any of the forces got up to Baghdad um, in Saudi Arabia, a little tent city. And we, we started launching ops before that wave got up there. So that was interesting living in inter interesting operations when you start incorporating, you know, fast movers as well as a tents with helicopters and midair refueling and mop gear because, you know, it was chem bio and all that kind of stuff. It, it, it was something else. So we were doing cross border ops before the invasion actually really had gotten started. Yeah. Or simultaneous with, but um, nobody was near Baghdad when we were going all around that area trying to find this guy or that thing or do this or do that. Oh, this is the, the deck of 52. You got it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So we were very active and then, Somebody somewhere decided we needed to get to Baghdad really quick. So we took a pretty hellacious C-130 ride up there, <laughs> got dropped, dropped off at the airport. It was pretty special. It was definitely pretty <laughs> special. So I thought we were doing fine where we were at. We were launching ops pretty much nightly, but they had to have us there. So off we went. And it was fine. It was fine. But, you know, we had armored Humvees, and we learned that they were pretty worthless in a situation like that. So... Uh, we were able to get some Bradley fighting vehicles, and I, I'd heard horrible things about them, but I fell in love with them. And uh, M1 tank is a pretty formidable thing, too. So, <laughs> yeah, we, we elicited a lot of help from other people while there. What was it like for the new guys coming on board? I had, you know, because you guys have already had time in Afghanistan. Now you're, it's like during the invasion of Iraq. They've been vanilla seals. I don't know if they've had combat time or if they wanted it. Like, had Green Team changed or did they, did you guys have kind of slap some sense into them when they showed up? I'm, I'm wondering, that's a good question. I'm wondering if Green Team did change. I'm assuming it did on some level. Like, I left the assault team I was on in 99 and got forced to go teach Green Team for a couple of years. So that was still pretty status quo i guess and I, i'm sure there were definitely some changes implemented because of 9 11 and the lessons learned at least i hope so it'd be foolish to not so but as far as new guys coming in they're just you know wide-eyed and ready to go yeah and i never saw an issue with it you know we knew who was who and you know but you never know who the first guy through the door is going to be you can plan it and i wouldn't plan it to be that new guy i just got from green team but sometimes it ends up being that new guy from Green Team because this helicopter had this problem or that door, you're not getting to it. And then we're going to enter from this door. We're going to breach a wall or, the, you know, the circumstances go on and on. So at any time, somebody that gets off that helicopter could be put in a, a pretty uh, premier role that you didn't plan. You want to talk about um, the Jessica Lynch rescue? Like what, when did that come up on your radar and you guys got tapped for that? Well, obviously, when that uh, motor motorcade got attacked, it came on a radar because there was dead Americans as well as some that were missing. So we were briefed on it as much as we could be. We were still doing our ongoing missions, and we'd get an intel spike on her location or others. And, you know, we'd get spun up to go, and it would fall through or whatever. But then that real intel came in when that doctor or whatever he was brought that briefcase with the camera in it and he he actually had a proof of life and where she was and uh we rolled out pretty quick that night actually can, um, can you tell us about the op and how, how it went down yeah it was ginormous i think <laughs> we were in baghdad and that guy i spent the time with on afo again his name was hans they loaded us hans was running our sniper cell and i was running the assault side they sent us up to Nazaria and just him and I, the helicopter took us up there and we met. It was a one star general who sees us. And now he's ready to take the bridge and go hit every. I mean, he was a motivated young one star. And it was 
it was quite cool. The Marines had gotten their ass kicked a little bit there. I think they lost a number of people in that Nazaria Nazare area. And he was uh, ready to go light it up. And we're like, sir, you know, we're here, you know, for the lynch thing and the plans of. So the planning had already started. And that was um, one of Dev Group's downfalls. I think they were always, not always, but sometimes just late to the game on the initial planning. And you have to be, especially when you're, doing it with um, conventional forces, which I think there were 1,400 people involved in that Jessica Lynch. Wow. You know, my troop had 23 guys and we had the hospital, we were the hospital clearance, um, but there was like 1,400 people. One, she's a hot blonde from West Virginia. So, you know, there was a lot of public outcry and motivation to go get her. So I think if I had been in one in the hospital, I think I'd still be there. But um, it wasn't me. It was it wasn't me. It was Jessica. So the planning was already ongoing when it was the night before the op when Hans and I got there. I mean, they had the table built and they had the schematics from the hospital. I think that was built by the Japanese. It's amazing their ability to pull up stuff like that sometimes. So we're looking at that. But our quick quick reaction force were Rangers and their insertion point was something like 800 meters away. And I'm looking at the maps and I'm thinking, you know, we could probably get them a little closer. 800 meters can be a long way, especially in a bad area. So I'm thinking along those lines. And then they had the breach point. There was a big wall on the outside of the hospital and the Rangers are going to breach here and then clear these auxiliary buildings. But anything downrange of those buildings were the hospital where we're going to be. So I finally spoke up. I'm like, hey, you know, I don't really like the insertion point for the QRF. And if we breach this wall instead of that wall, anything, you know, your field of fire is not going to have us down range of. And that one star is like, hold what you got. We went and had a cup of coffee, started yelling at me about where the commanding officer was. And I'm like, sir, I don't know where my commanding officer is. <laughs> Just me and Hans. He's like, your points are valid, but, you know, this has already been planned and that's what we're going with. And I'm like, okay. So... The next morning, our boys got there. We drew it out the best we could, and then we we initiated it. Um, some little birds, some 60s. There was talk as to whether to keep a 60. Well, we one, you know, we had ISR, so we we're trying to – a lot of vehicles were moving in and out. But I went in on the little bird to see if the front door was going to be a breach point or not. It wasn't. Uh, whether we kept a 60 spinning on the deck right out front. I think the hospital was seven stories. She was on the second floor. Again, there's so many details. And I don't want to bore you or whoever's no, listening. No, I love hearing no. it. But it it went as well as it could go. Um, a good friend of mine who I'd, I had wor worked for another agency, had worked with me in Afghanistan, speaks a language. I put him on one of our back helicopters to come with us. And his name's Dan. I'm like, Dan. As soon as you see somebody that looks in charge, snatch them up and find out where Jessica is. We knew where she was, but I'm like, just in case. And if she's not there, have that dude at the top of the stairs, second floor again. So sure enough, we got to her room, locked, uh, shotgunned our way in, and she's not there. So that was one of the worst radio calls you ever can make. Mm -hmm. It's like a dry hole for something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So I put that out, worked our way back to the staircase. And there was Dan and this dude and a security guy. And uh, he's like, no, she's down here in this room. And sure enough, there she was. Wow. So, you know, you had to think, got got a doc in. He assessed her. Uh, pararescue guy was with me. And I think we had her from finding her to ha having her on that 60 in like nine minutes on time on target. And uh, there's a lot of things that happened that I, I would have liked to have cleared the rest of the hospital because the last thing we wanted is to car carry her out. And somebody from a top floor having an, an angle down on that 60 or on her or on us. But decision was made to move her as fast as possible, and we did. So we did spend the rest of the night there. Our quick reaction force didn't get there in a very timely fashion. Again, nothing against the Rangers, but it took a little while. A uh, not um, very quick QRF. Yeah, well, it was uh, – well, yeah, it wasn't great. But those guys were amazing. They got there and – that same doctor or people in the hospital had pointed out where remains were yep. buried out yep. front and they literally dug them up with their hands mm -hmm. and it was it, it pretty, pretty moving, uh, amazing stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it gives me like, it, it, it was an incredible night. Obviously we went and got the little hop one. We got out of there. Things went super good. Spending a night hanging out there with some good friends. 
And then the next night they launched us on some bullshit back to what we talked about earlier that nobody will ever know about. But it, it was uh, something I'll always remember. And I th think I sent you a picture. I, I, again, I was one of the guys that carrying her down the stairs and she was a mess. Uh, she wasn't saying anything that made any sense, but she said something going down the stairs. And I'm not going to quote it, but it was English. And I'm like, thank God, man, maybe this chick's going to be OK. And I told myself that one day I'd like to have a beer with her. And uh, through some other program that had her on, that the guy knew me, put us in contact. She was out in Phoenix for her friend Peshua, and I hope I'm not mispronouncing that name, that got killed in her vehicle with her and her good friend in the Army. There was something going on for Private Peshua in Phoenix, and she was going to be out there and contacting me. So I drove up, and I had a beer with her, and it was super cool. And I thoroughly enjoyed that beer. She's, now, she's a good young lady. Now, it's interesting because this goes back to what your primary mission was, the counterterrorism and hostage rescue. And this was the first successful hostage rescue since World War II, right? I, I've heard that. You know, I'm not a historian. Well, there, was, there, there was <laughs> Kurt Muse is the other one that, that comes up right. in my mind that gives me goosebumps where, you know, American troops coming in. And I mean, that's got to be a good feeling. Yeah, where where was that one? Was that Panama. Vietnam? Panama. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah, right. I, I, don't if, I don't know if there could be a better feeling. Like, and like I said, we drew it out as best we could. Like, there's the stairs. There's the front door. The stairs inside. We we had a video of it all. That guy that got us that intel. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know where he is today, but God bless him. So we had as much as we could ask for. And then I'm with my men and, you know, we knew we might get our ass kicked and flying in, you know, we're, I'm on the outside of one of the little birds and it's like a, it's, it's like a movie scene except for a lot of nights were, but that night, I mean, it was the, they were doing uh distraction fires and by distraction fires, I mean, they were lighting the hell out of the places around there. And it was just amazing to sit outside a little bird going in to do something like that. Yeah. And it, you know, as we were loading up, the guys could not have been more fired up. I think we got word that day. I think it was April Fool's Day that night <laughs> that we went in to get her. But that day, like at 1300, we got word that, you know, she she was killed. And you want to talk about being demoralized. Like the guys were ready to go. Like we didn't care if it was daylight or like less launch, even though that would be stupid. And uh, and quickly that changed, obviously. And and off we went. But the guys were very super motivated and Hashi rescues a whole different animal. Yeah. There's, there's no barricade of flow or anything like that. It's, it's get to your principal period, right. whether it's stepping over friends or whatever you you cannot slow down the assault on a hostage rescue. Um, obviously we could talk more as, as more of those things happen as those wars progressed and some more lessons learned from different places all over the world. But that particular night, it was go find the little blonde chick, and we did. Well, that uh, that if she's listening. I apologize to her. I don't. I called her a little blonde chick or hot a couple <laughs> few, many times. So, sorry, Jessica. So I'll buy you another beer. <laughs> You're a seal. Everybody can, will forgive it. <laughs> um, and uh, tip of the hat to uh, the guy, that guy Dan that you mentioned. Yeah. Oh, what a rock star. We still stay in touch. It's not very frequent. I think he lives in Prague with his family now, but an absolute rock star and where he came from and what he did for us, it, it can't be overstated. I mean, in, in, in Afghanistan, there was a lot of SIGINT. So he wore his, I mean, when we're trying to get rest, he's, he's listening to whatever the hell those nutbags listen to, just trying to figure stuff out so we could do our job and uh, nothing but love. Nothing yeah. but. Um, what did you guys make of the controversy shortly after the just? Because I still remember this. Um, after the Jessica Lynch rescue, about it being pre-planned or pre like ba basically acted out, and everybody had blank firing adapters. <laughs> I I just think it's exactly that. It's just you know. I was outside the little bird that night and I didn't see any of that. So and, and it, it, I knew I knew the guys I was with, uh, we were expecting quite the fight. Uh, 
supposedly the uh, Fedeen had used the basement of that hospital for planning, and they had. We ended up clearing the basement, even though we were expecting our ranger friends to do that, but they weren't there yet, so we went to head down there. And they had, they had giant sand tables and, and friendly positions. And it's, it had been a base of some sort, but they weren't there anymore. Yeah. So I, I did hear all those reports and the BFAs and the rest of it. I just get a kick out of stuff like that. So it was, I also liked the way the media portrayed and neither did she as a hero and her gun went dry. She mm -hmm. was knocked unconscious and she woke up, you know, as a prison, prisoner of war. And she's the first one to admit it, you know? So yeah, yeah. I don't know. The media and even the the military just tried to spin it off to more than it was, and it was good enough as it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's fascinating. Do you know how many bodies they were able to exhume? Uh, I want to. I want to say two, but I think it was more than that. I, I don't. I, I, I think. I think it was. I think it may have been closer, and I don't know off the top of my head, but I think it was closer to like a dozen that they yeah, pulled out I, of that at the pit. Yeah, I think the right out front, I think there were just two. But, um, yeah, I, re I really don't know, and I probably should. I apologize for that. But um, <clears throat> amazing what those guys did to respect the dead there. It was something there's, else. There's a, a vignette in, in Marty's book behind you there, uh, Violence of Action, that, that talks about the, the ranger point of view um, and, and exhuming the remains. And it, it was pretty gnarly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because they, yeah, because they were... I don't want to say fresh. That's horrible. But but they but they were recently deceased. They, they were decomposing, and the rangers yeah. were having to exhume them with their hands, and guys vomiting. But but you you and the other guys out there, I mean, they did it to repatriate Americans. Uh, I mean, it was it was an honorable mission that you guys did. One hundred percent. That and nothing but kudos. Again, I feel like I bad mouth the rangers a little <laughs> bit when some of my best friends are and. Um, no, not, nothing but love, as I said before. So, yeah, that was something else. So, so you guys get back to uh, back to the team house, so to speak. Dekidding, everyone's high fiving, and they spin you back up on another one. A complete bullshit op that we literally had a, a model of in our team room, and oh, it wow. was a it was a long flight and refueling, and we got the shit hammered out of us, and it was basically to leave pamphlets. Like because of for real, and other, yeah, it was so. Uh, it I was, thought you were gonna I, say you were going after the WMDs or something. No, that that's a whole other story. I'll have to say for another time. But we went after the number one chem bio target in Iraq while we were still in Saudi Arabia, the number one target, and it was anything but. And that was like, okay, what are we doing in this country? Like. Oh, man. Before the big wave hit Baghdad or any of that, like the number one chem bio target, we hit it very early on, and it was a basically an Iraqi 4-H club. It Holy was shit! So freaking demoralized. Like, so you guys go in like in like the J list suits and everything, expecting World mop, War Three. Full mop, yeah. Full well, mop gear. Yeah, and it's, and it was, it's a country club. Yep, it was well. I'll, I'll tell the brief part of the story. There's a big hospital that had a lot of air handling units on top. And then this building that had a telescoping pathway that connect them to. So the, the big mines thought they were taking prisoners and poisoning them, getting them to a level or whatever, and then moving them into the hospital with all this extra hand, air handling gear and seeing how their chem bio stuff was working. Um, and it just spun out of control. I think some of the, Intel types just read way too many like Tom Clancy or Stephen King novels or something like I looked at this hospital outside of Baghdad and I'd be like, it doesn't it get like 120 degrees there in the summer, you know, on an average day, like, couldn't that be it? Or, you know, and no, this was it. So we had all the chem stuff, um, you know, to take swabs and the doors are going to be this and, you know, full, full kit, the mop gear, which is kind of hard to fight with. We didn't have permission to take out the transformers of that town to blacken it for us. Mm -hmm. Luckily, there was a field really close to the, our entry point, but there was apartment buildings, and we really did get shot up really bad. Our our helicopters specifically, uh, they all got shot up, but the one I was in, you know, you just remember the bullets going through, and you don't know if you should kneel or stand or, you know, where where do you move, which is safer than what, and 
gas mask on and you're two minutes out when the A-10s got permission to take out the transformers, which are close, which made a big fireball, which perfectly silhouetted the helicopters. And then, you know, all the ineffective fire became effective. And the, the first door we went through was a hollow core wood door. And literally before we loaded, I'm on a phone with some big head in Nevada, wherever, telling me what to look for, where to take samples from, all that stuff. Once again, helicopters are turning. I'm like, Roger that. Off we go. And it was just a 4-H, Iraqi 4-H club, like agriculture and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it, those 4-H kids, though, they can they can uh, be pretty <laughs> devious. The threat right? is real. The threat yeah. is real, guys. They, they can, uh, you know, some of those science projects that they, that they put together. Um, well, I hope they're good at do-it-yourself projects because we kind of made a mess of their little schoolhouse. Yeah. So, um, uh, unfortunately. But well, that was about as demoralized about as Iraq as I could be. And that was literally one of our first targets. And, you know, you just start questioning. You know, all we heard is right. Cambio, Cambio, the number one. Like, we had it to scale model of the place. Like, we planned it as best we could. Got there and got the shit hammered out of us. And thinking, okay, they're trying to protect this shit. And once inside, we're like, nope, not yeah. what we expected. So it's and I probably shouldn't be talking about that because I don't know the whole chem bio thing. Uh, yeah, it, I, it I'm, seemed I'm, be- I'm glad you did, though, Nelson, because I mean, it's so fascinating. I mean, Iraq is what it is. We all know now, but it's so fascinating to hear it from the operator perspective, from literally at the, the point of the spear. You don't necessarily get to hear that kind of perspective about, you know, the impact on U.S. foreign policy and the decisions that are made. Yeah, yeah. Can you, for people uh, who haven't been in the military and had the joy and pleasure of even putting on mop gear, <laughs> can can you describe it to? Can you tell us what mop gear? You don't have to give us the military acronym for mop, because, uh, but but can you tell us what it is and why it's such a joy to try to operate in? I don't even know what the acronym stands. for. I, I don't it's, either. It's mission oriented protective posture. There you go. <laughs> Nice. Look at the brains on Brad. I know Nicely the big done. brain yeah. on Brad. This is, this is this is what I do twenty four seven. So I have to know all this crazy stuff. <laughs> it's just like this. There's, I think there's charcoal lined in it. It's just like a giant heavy smock <laughs> with pants, and you put over boots on. So you wear your regular stuff, and then you put this on, and then you put your body armor and all your gear, and then of course it's accompanied by a really comfortable gas mask that always fogs up, mm-hmm. and then you run around and pretending to be able to do the stuff that you can do without it. So <laughs> we we did train with it, but not not enough. But you know, like I said, we got through that first door, and it didn't take long for me to be like take the freaking gas mask off and let's figure out what's going on. This hollow core doors are not going to be number one chem bio target. Right. Uh, A hollow core door is basically what you'd find on somebody's bathroom. Right. Right. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, Like an angry eight year old could kick it in. Right. Don't even waste a hat and round on it. Just push the door open. Right. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Right. So that was that. Um, but so that was always I think it was always in the back of my mind for the rest of my time in Iraq, like, you know, questioning what we're doing here. But you can't let that mm-hmm. you, know, you still got a mission that night that you got to execute. And if you're not on your A game, you know, things could go sideways. So we were able to still maintain that focus. But, you know, I, I will not argue that in the back of my mind, the whole premise of being there was the chem bio thing. At least I thought it was. And um, the number one chem bio target was not that. Right. And so, uh, there were a lot of people hurt and uh, civilians as well that, you know, I, I think of if, if if it was my neighborhood and, and we started attacking, there'd probably be some fight back from me, too. And uh, there was just a lot of things like that that I don't have a hard time with because I don't dwell on it. But it, it's just what it was. We put our helmets back on and went back to work the next night. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the uh, mi- can you so the mission after the jessica lynch mission the uh the flyers um why do you know why they were pushing so hard for that it was one of saddam's i think it was lake tartar was the name of it and it was like a peninsula Mm -hmm. with three tall guard houses and then one of his palaces right but because of fuel considerations we literally had like something like 18 minutes time on target it was a large palace that isr told us it was abandoned 
So we went in. I went in on the first 60 with the Rangers, actually, because they were going to be, we don't have enough people to cover three guard towers and then clear a big palace. So they, they had given us hundreds of these flyers that I think when it, when uh, translated said something like, we can see you, something stupid and cheesy like that. So we we're supposed to spread them all over this palace. So I made the mistake with the Rangers, like the three guard, it was a, it was a spit of land with the, the big palace and the three guard towers, and we're landing in the middle of it. And ISR said, we're good, but, you know, you, you, taking the low ground and bringing a helicopter in there sounded kind of shitty. So we employed Rangers as our blocking force, and the helicopter I was in, I'm like, hey, I'm going to go in with them and just get an assessment from the ground before we bring the assault team in, like, be close. And and it, it worked worked like that but we landed uh i think it was guard tower number three that my helicopter was to cover guard tower number three we get off the helicopter and they shot every bullet they had brought <laughs> and then some like they just opened up on this so i'm talking to the other helicopters telling them to come in that everything's good and they're like what the freak is all the firing about and i'm like i really don't know <laughs> but, but i don't think we're receiving any so we spent our time on target, spread the stupid pamphlets around and extract. And then I'm with the Ranger guys. I'm like, hey, man, what what were you shooting at? And they're like, sir, you said to cover guard tower number three. And some, you know, verbiage, I guess, is a little different. I just wanted them to have guns on it in case something did happen there. I didn't mean to expand or <laughs> shoot every single bullet you had. But it was, it was some good times like that learning you know to work with others but <laughs> lessons they learned shot, they shot the shit out of guard tower number three i will tell you that so the next couple of years um what you before you retired in in 2005 i am in and out of iraq a, a little bit not not really not so much like i got back from iraq and i don't think it's a sad story but my uh our command master chief at the time was with us in Iraq and was actually on target with us on the, with the ground assault force at the hospital for Jessica. And I, I don't mean to bad mouth him. I got nothing bad to say about him, but I got called to his office after that deployment to Iraq. And uh, I was an E8 and coming up for E9. And he asked me what I thought my future was with at the command. And I'm like, I'm going to make E9 and take over one of the squadrons. And he's like, I think you did your you were great at war, but you don't get along with the third deck. The third deck was our admin deck. Mm. And, you know, one thing I think I can honestly say I pride myself in is if you worked for our assault team and me in some fashion, whether you were a comm guy or a rigger or anything else, I treated you just like you were a SEAL. Like I just expected professionalism and, you know, and if if you weren't good at your job, you were going to know same thing with the assaulters. Like mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I treated them as equal, but his feeling is I, I was hard on the support people, which I completely to this day disagree with. And I, and I asked him like, what are you talking about? It's like, yeah, I was there and you're yelling a lot. And I'm like, you know, master chief, I'm, I yell a lot. Anyway, I was yelling at everybody, you know, if they needed to be yelled at anyway, he thought the best thing for my career would go back to go back to the white side and give back to the community. So he did not want me picking up E9 and staying at the command. And he was the command master chief. So I'm like, I think that was 2004. So I'm like, hey, I appreciate your honesty. I shook his hand and I walked across, I walked across the hall and dropped my papers to retire in 2005. Wow. So I think almost the better part of my last year at that command, I was literally in air operations, mm -hmm. which worked out good for me transitioning to take that job out at Pinal Air Park outside of Tucson. And, um, and that was it. So um, if I have some regrets, would that would have been it. I still don't understand how you're a troop chief at that command and you were told you're very good at the combat stuff, but administratively you're not doing as well as you should. So <laughs> right. It didn't really set well with me. And obviously I don't think it does today, but that is what happened. I wish him nothing but the best, but I also hope I never see him again. You co correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, um, that sounds like maybe it was one of those things where you just like pushed back too much on certain things. Probably. You know, I mentioned, I think early in this podcast that, you know, I, I had nothing against officers, but I, I do believe you have to know your role. And when I first sure. got to Damneck, 
I was in an assault team and I wish I would have appreciated it more because it had the strongest enlisted leadership I'd seen ever. And I just thought that was the way they all were. But no, I was just super lucky. Our team chief and our boat crew leaders and our, at that time they were called element leaders, became troop chiefs. Again, when we had to change because the army couldn't understand all that. Um, they were just rock stars. And we would do a house run and they'd debrief it. And I'd, I'd be in awe, like how in the hell are they seeing and knowing what was, I mean, they were just really good at what they did. And if an officer had something to debrief, they would just be eaten up alive. Like that, it was just what it was. And it started evolving the wrong way. Um, rank never really made, made a difference. Like I was an LPO, a leading petty officer at SEAL Team 2 as an E5 deployed. Uh, maybe it was partially because of performance or luck or just timing, but you know, rank is more overlooked within the SEAL teams than I think other organizations. Mm -hmm. You could work as an E8 for an E7, and that sl slowly started going away. As guys made rank, maybe because their ratings were more open, you know, they became chief maybe before I did and took a boat crew. And the guy operationally wasn't super strong. And then officers started speaking at debriefs. And, you know, I remember the old times and I would push back, not my position to push back, but that's kind of who I was. And it became, you know, a bit of a pissing contest, I guess. So I think that went into the command master chief's position to be like, you know, I'm not going to give you a squadron. I think it's time for you to get out of here. So now was you know, the was the third deck, though, also like the support element? Like, was it like personnel and stuff like that? Absolutely. Because, Absolutely. Because I know that, uh, you know, things might be a lot different now. And I have nothing but love for support personnel. Like, they're in the military, they're just like anybody else, just like an operator. They're doing their job. But it's also a place where people who want to slide can slide. You know, they can skate. Yeah. And, yep. and like, pay is different now than it was then, right? Yeah. It, everything's automated. Like, Everything is, I'm sure it was automated then to a degree too, but there were times when you'd have to go fight for a soldier's pay because it had been dropped and you could right. tell somebody was being a lazy ass. Yep. Yep. You know, you're spot on, but you know, I still, I don't have a, a lot of good friends from those days, but I still have some like that. I still talk to fairly regularly and, uh, and a couple of them were in support roles, but they're not in support roles. They're doing their job that just right. happens to be support of the assault team. Right. Uh, but if I get back and, you know, I got one radio in one ear for the uh, the assault frequency and the other ear is command and control, and it's not working. I'm not going to be nice to my comm guy. You know, we're <laughs> going to have some freaking words. But they're also, our support personnel at Damn Neck, we're the best of the best. Yeah. They get screwed like everybody else, whether they're boat mechanics or, you know, comm guys or they're they're really good at what they do. But that's what you're supposed to be. Right. You're supposed to be that major league baseball team, right? Right. So um no, there's a few times I can become very emotional and I may have a few times, but talk to any SEAL that I've worked with, they know it, it goes that way as well. Right. So Right. It's just that's just who I've always been. I may right. have calmed down now that I'm really, really old, but I don't think, <laughs> I don't think I've calmed down that much. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I, I in the army, they 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 call it like the field soldier versus the garrison soldier. And, and Fair. right. And and there are soldiers that are great in garrison. Boots are always polished, always looking sharp, know all the right answers, know all the regs. And then those aren't always the guys who are best in the field. Right. And those guys, even as long ago as it was in Damn Neck, were the guys that seemed to be the yes men, kind of. Right. You know, they always said what needed. They they would say what needed to be heard, not with the ground truth. Right. Like even after actions reports in combat, after actions reports that I would write as a troop chief, by the time it went up the chain of command, it would be other than who was there and the date. It would be an entirely. Different, that's why I don't really believe a lot of history because it's like, wait a second, you know. I was on this. <laughs> right. That's not what took place. Right. Well, that's not what they want to hear up in Warcom or so whatever com. And I'm like, right. who cares what they want to hear? Yeah. How can they make real decisions right. if right. they don't have real ground truth? And, right. And and you know, it's interesting because you left in 2005 and you saw that and it became even more problematic and more endemic. I mean, that to the point where 
I don't think that our our politicians at at the executive level could make real decisions because they weren't being fed the truth. Could not agree more. And you know, usually getting out like cold turkey is kind of hard on guys because they go from that to civilian sector very quickly. But I took a job working at the drop zone where I'd see the guys, the same guys I deployed with at that time. Obviously now, you know, we we got a lot of years between them, but I'd see them and they'd work there and train and we'd go out and grab a beer, grab something to eat. And they would say, man, you should have been on this mission. You would have loved this, but you wouldn't believe the politics that are happening at the command. And it was just continuing down that slide. And uh, again, I still think it's, Definitely one of the top commands in the world, and I'm nothing but um, proud of serving there. But I think I probably got out at the best time, or I would have retired as an E6. Or worse. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So, right. So talk to us a little bit about that transition. I mean, you did just lay it out a little bit. Um, so you got a job working at Yuma at uh, the Halo Committee, I take it? No, absolutely not. We've got a... Uh, it's called parachute training and testing facility. It's just outside of Tucson. Okay. And only a couple units use it. Okay. Um, it's strictly for them. And it's a big facility, state of the art, jump, jumping. So we'll teach green team out there. Uh, squadrons will come out for proficiency training, tandem. I mean, there's nothing that doesn't happen out there. And it's in the middle of the desert. So, you know, we can get the 25,000 feet pretty much whenever we want. Um, yeah, I, I left there. I worked there for 14 years, and then I hung that hat up for, honestly, some political bullshit that was happening there, too. But it was good because I didn't just go from with the boys to completely alienated from. I mean, I'd see them, and it was it was kind of sad sometimes because they tell me about they did this, and I'd be like, son of a bitch, you know, I did I just slept with three men to be on that op type of stuff. <laughs> but so it kind of hurt my heart, but you know, my finger was still close to the pulse of not on it. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, my, yeah. My, my transition was easier than others. Yeah. And at the same time, you're building up these business endeavors that you have going on. True. But that that job at the parachute training and testing facility was it, it wasn't 40 hours. It was a lot more than that a week. So and, you know, going in, we would do our night jumps pre-dawn. So getting up at two o'clock to go to work was pretty much a regular occurrence. And this week, it might be this unit. Next week's another one. So it, it became Groundhog Day. And I took it quite seriously. And I I, I still applaud what they do out there. Um, but after 14 years, it was enough. And in the background, I had the businesses that we, you know, we decided to expand and um, keep going there. So yeah, it was, it was a little bit much. Um, but yeah, here we are. <clears throat> that the, uh, honestly, to me, it's it's incredible. You must have found the right staff, the right managers to keep those businesses going while you were deploying and so deep in other things. You missed the point where I was writing checks every month to keep the place open. I think. Yeah, no, oh, I, yeah, I, 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 I heard that. Yeah, there was a there was a lot of poor management decisions being made early on, but. Um, some friends were closing a, a another local restaurant. I had known their front of the house and their back of the house, house managers. I think I had had Trident for 11 years or so at that time. And they were going to be on the market looking for jobs. And they were highly recommended to me. So I brought them in. And I think the Trident Grill was a ship that had like barnacles all over it. It wasn't uh -huh. going the wrong way. But it just wasn't cut through the water very good type of thing. So I brought them in. And they righted the ship very quickly. And then uh, we ended up opening Trident 2. And I I offered and gave them ownership percentages. So I'm still the majority owner of the, the restaurants, but they are owner operators. And it, cool. they're the ones that do it day to day and they're doing a great job. So, you know, kudos out to them. Um, yeah. And, and, and that you, was necessary. Or or I would have just had to be there more. I, yeah. No way I worked the hours I was working and the restaurant. Yeah. There's just... And yeah. you, you mentioned that you have uh, more recently gotten involved in the not-for-profit space. Yeah, it's kind of hard to believe, you know, from troop chief and that command back in the day. But there's a, a giant nonprofit called Greater Goods Charity. And I, I beg you guys to look into it a little bit. Uh, it's it's all over the place, but it's big. And I've known their head shed for some time. They're friends socially. And I'd hear about what they're doing and what they're not doing. And it, it was 
very appealing. Like appealing is not the it was it was eye opening as to what's out there. So the earthquakes happen. I'm even wearing a Greater Good Charity shirt. But uh, the earthquake happened in southern Turkey, and they were going over there for humanitarian aid. And I volunteered to go for a week. So I spent a week over there, got back. We talked about basically in after actions of what I saw and what I would do different. And they offered me a job and um, in field operations. So I took that job in April. And a couple of weeks ago, I was in Ukraine doing an assessment for spaying and neutering of dogs and cats. I mean, the group they sent me with was a little sketch. And I, I only say that because I think a, they may be listening right now. But uh, no, they were wonderful, completely professional. And we did the assessment and we're going to go back to do that. But with that, we've got ongoing humanitarian aid. But everybody does that. That's the easy part. But the spay and neuter dogs and cats in Ukraine and a giant bee program over there. I could talk about it for another hour, but I won't waste your time. Um, while in Ukraine, we even got tattoos. It's, it's in Ukrainian, but it says amplify the good which is the hashtag for greater good charity. Cool. So thank you for letting me plug that a little bit, but to go from troop chief to a dude in Ukraine two weeks ago, looking, assessing the need of spaying and neutering cats when <laughs> air raid sirens are going off and shit. I mean, you really can't make it up, but I tell you what, for an old man, it's pretty good for my heart. That's and awesome. I, I'm, That's I'm very lucky and uh, I hope they don't fire me anytime soon. We'll so, see. So let's do a real quick call to action. Anybody listening to this now or later, greatergood.org. Go there and drop them five bucks. It's a coffee, yeah. right? Just drop them five bucks. Like, like help a brother out. If you don't do it, the terrorists could not way. appreciate that more. Just, just go to the website and see all everything that Greater Good is into. I mean, it's it's an aspect of life I've never thought about. I've never been mm -hmm. much of a humanitarian. But pets have an unbelievable soft spot in my heart, animals in general, and uh, it's pretty good. Um, and also, I, and thank, you, thank, you, thank you both for bringing that up. I do appreciate course. it. And also, when you're in Tucson, or maybe go to Tucson as a destination, uh, check out Trident Grill. Like, one of five locations. One, two, three, four, or five. Go check them out. Please do. That applies to you two as well. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. I'd love to. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, absolutely. So, um, Nelson, I mean, uh, I mean, this has been a super cool interview, and I mean, it's like breadth of experience. I mean, it's been really fun. Um, anything that I that we failed to cover, failed to ask, any pearls of wisdom to to drop on people out there? Honestly, looking back, I feel like it's just been a big run on sentence out of my face. So I, I hope some of it made some sense. Yeah. And I didn't bore you guys too much. No, but not at no, all. you know, the, the biggest thing that I tried to. And we talked about it earlier, it's like everything in life, you got to pretend that that could be a, the thing in life. Like mm. it's just so easy to just get stuck up, stuck in the minutia of daily crap. That, you know, next thing you know, you're 57 years old and you're wondering, you know, <laughs> how much longer we got here. And it's just <laughs> it, it's a pretty special thing. Like uh, I, nobody is luckier than I am. And I'm just happy I realized that. And I wish others did and uh, treated this country and, and just treated each other better than we do. That's awesome, man. Uh, I know this has been really cool, man. I'm so happy to hear your story. Well, well Thank you for letting me share it, and I'm I'm glad you guys aren't asleep right now. No, not no, at all. It, it, it's it's fantastic. <laughs> it's fascinating. It's like it, I I just can't believe, honestly. When you think of what Joes, what 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 soldiers and sailors and Marines do in their off time, especially when they have a high stress job, job, I can't believe that you were running a business. <laughs> like halfway across the country. It's amazing. You're forgetting the feeling part. The, it was, You're writing the, checks. The only, reason, the only reason that place is still open, because just like Bud's, you just refuse to quit. Like anybody with any sense would have been like, hey, <laughs> this is a bad idea and pulled chocks. But I'm like, nope. I mean, it's named Trident, which is the insignia we wore in our uniform. I mean, it means a lot to me. Right, you know, I right. think if you talk to the customers, most that go in have no idea. They right. just think you have some 
seafood or something, but, and they don't need to know. I don't, I don't give a shit. Like, uh, <laughs> but I'm not going to let that fail. And it, and it didn't. And we have five of them now. So, you know, hire the right people, I guess, is the, the, the right way to go there. That's incredible. Uh, so we have some questions real quick. Um, Jackson, thank oh. you very much. How different are the cultures between um, uh, Gold, Red, Blue Squadron and the difference between Assault and Recce? Also, are there rivals, rivalries with HRT and CAG? HRT and CAG, and let's get back to that one. As far as the the rivalry between the the color teams, of course that's there, and and as we spoke earlier, that's the healthy thing. But you know, when I was on Red, it was the best assault team in that building, right? <laughs> but after Green Team, after teaching Green Team for my penance down there, and I went up to Gold, Gold was the best assault team out <laughs> right, there, right? Right. And no matter, what, I mean, that's just the fact, and I'm I'm speaking the truth. <laughs> Everybody else will argue with me, but. <laughs> And if you don't have that mindset, then you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. So there was something else, not the HRT thing, something in between there. But he, he mentioned the, the colors and then what else? Uh, the difference between assault and recce. A recce is just our sniper. So we'll we'll have in a, you know, you, in my day we had three assault teams under underneath the squadron, and then you had a recce team assigned. They're part of your squadron too, but when we're going to do house runs, they might be going to the known distance ranges or doing, you know, those freak snipers things. So that's that's what we called recce. I, I can't speak of other units. Did you ever go and like pull up your UDTs? And go, ah, I used to be a sniper, or I was a sniper all in, the time. In team two. <laughs> I I miss those UDTs. I tell you what, <laughs> those, are, those are classic. <laughs> classic. <laughs> Uh, yeah. As far as the HRT and what did he say? CAG. CAG? Like, yeah, what were the rivalries? Also were there. But you kind of touched on that. But what was your relationship or did you have a relationship with HRT? Little bit. They got into the jump stuff a little bit. So we didn't work with them, obviously, entire, entirely dif different mission sets, but also quite the same. So, you know, the relation between HRT, we're talking about the hostage rescue team, yeah, I'm assuming. Yeah. 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 Um, I've got some friends within that organization. I, I think I may have even considered going that route at one time because it just sounds cool, but I didn't. And I don't even think they asked me to, so I don't know that it would have gone very far anyway. But uh, I think any training that you can help them out or they can possibly help you out should be looked at. Uh, there's some legal issues regarding that type of stuff. And we used to do realistic urban training and work with local SWAT teams in LA or Boston or New Orleans and things like that. But it, it can get a little dicey on the legal side of the house, but that wasn't our business. So no, we didn't work with HRT a lot. Most of the work we did, uh, I guess we did some shooting with them, but nothing to hang your hat on some jumping too. Yeah. So they, they ended up coming, they ended up wanting to get a, a jump team together and we helped them with that. Did you ever consider going with to the leapfrogs? No, I make fun of them all the time. Okay. And uh, we had a guy, it's funny, a friend of mine was just at Arlington yesterday and she was sending pictures and she's asked, she asked, is there anybody there that, you know, friends of yours, or whatever. And of course there's many of them, but his name is Lou Langless and he came to green team when I was teaching green team from the leapfrogs. And to me, if you want to be a leapfrog or a buzz instructor, you've got no reason to go to damn neck. I just don't. So I didn't have any room in my heart for him. And he was a <laughs> tremendous operator. I mean, and and just a, a good man and a badass. But I put him through hell during green team because he came from the leapfrogs. Um, that's just one of my little quirks. But no, I, I never considered it. No, sir. Uh, Luis Vasquez, thank you very much. Um, I've seen a pattern of SEALs and entrepreneurial ventures. What transferable skills from the military did you find to be useful in your business ventures? Uh, just simply put, just don't quit. And I think because you have a background like we all have, you know, it's, it's things aren't as hard as people that don't have the background think they are. You know what I mean? Like the expectations need to be minimized when it comes to restaurants and stuff like that. But 
is it really that hard? You know, wage percentage should be this. It's not. Well, fix it. Liquor percentage should be this. Like, but people get all wrapped up because they've never really had adversity. We've all experienced things that really mattered and, and you know, had much greater consequences than mm -hmm. my wage cost. Or, you know, so I just think it's, you know, just go at it and, and don't let things fail. It, it's it's really quite simple. I, I wish I had... Uh, a deeper, more philosophic <laughs> way to describe that. But it, it, there's really, that's it. Have you ever told an employee to unfuck themselves? Oh, uh, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, it's a little different, but I'm a big Redskins fan or commanders or whatever they're called. And they haven't been a good football team since I was a young man. I don't know if you guys follow football, but they haven't been good. But I watch every Redskins home game at the original Trident. And I had longer hair back then. And if they were losing in the fourth quarter, which they generally were, <laughs> I would put my hair in a side ponytail, like a rally ponytail. So like off the side of your head and all my staff, predominantly the servers and the, the girls that were there, that would be mandated. And I had one girl that refused. And so I asked her to clock out. And she's like, why? I'm like, it's because you're fired. And I literally fired her that day for not putting her hair in a side <laughs> ponytail. So it became quite the scene. You can't do that anymore. I'm not advocating for that or telling somebody to unfuck themselves or anything like that. It's a different <laughs> world these days. But that did happen. Six months later, she wanted to come back and I let her. So we're friends today. <laughs> but yeah, I fired, a, I fired a female for not putting her hair in a side ponytail when I told her to. Not proud of it, but it did happen. <laughs> uh, Spormer Group. Thanks, Clint. We appreciate it. Clint's a, a friend of ours. Uh, another great episode. Keep them coming. You guys rock. Uh, Joe's gotcha. Thank you very much. Do you ever foresee uh, Damn That being more like CAG and opening up their selection pipeline to other branches of the military? I hope not because Damneck doesn't have, I mean, we teach green team, but we teach green team to do that have been through buzz mm -hmm. and they've spent time in the SEAL teams. That whole thing about CAG and Damneck doesn't re really run a selection course. It's all bullshit. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I almost got in a fist fight with a CAG officer at a friend's retirement <laughs> because we were both drunk and he's giving me shit about the lack of a selection course. And I'm like, none of it makes sense. Damn neck does not need to recruit from outside. Uh, if you want to go to damn neck, get in the Navy, go to buds, earn the right to be screened, get screened, get accepted, go to green team. And then there you go. Right. It, it there, sounds lengthy, but it, there, 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 I mean, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but their philosophy is the selection course is buds being successful on a seal team and then green team. Right. Sounds pretty good to me. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's it. Exactly. You know, and if you want to go to CAG, you just got to volunteer. So they start, it could be a cook in the army or a, something in the Marine Corps. And then, you know, you're going through selection. They So they got to teach to the lowest common denominator. Mm. You know, all our guys have a commonality of graduating from BUDS training. Mm -hmm. uh, Cat Chaser, thank you very much for the donation and the uh, sticker. And Cat Chaser, thank you again for saying Super Chat. Uh, Mike Montgomery, thank you. Uh, did you know Tom Regan or Reagan seal for 30 years, 82 to 12 passed away in Jordan in 2016 knew him and his brother. I did not the name. I know a, a Regan, but he was in CAG. Um, no, don't recognize the name at all, but there's more seals than people think too. Like every time I bump into somebody, you know, I must've known I'm 57 now. So it's been a long time since I, I put on the kit. But it is still a small community, so sometimes the name will flash, but no, I don't recognize that one. Uh, Delta Zulu, thank you very much. Uh, ask Nelly if he will ever bring back karaoke to the OG Trident. No, the answer is no. <laughs> so I don't know who that is, but <laughs> we did do karaoke for a while, and it brought in people. But there was nothing worse in my world than having karaoke in a bar that you own. So, and the OG is the original Trident. So somebody there is, um, I hope they're having a good day right now. <laughs> I, I do want to say that he finished that with ha ha ha. Okay. So, perfect. So, as so, well, he should. 
So I think he knew. Uh, and one last question from, uh, oh, actually two. Uh, Lewis, uh, thank you very much. I don't understand sometimes, is the OPSEC stuff legally allowed to speak about to family or friends? And you admit some stuff that's hard to admit. Do you worry about, do you worry about being seen as the bad guy? The, I, I guess I got lost somewhere in there. I so, heard OPSEC. So the first question is, can you talk about OPSEC with your family and friends? Can you talk about like the OPSEC guess, stuff? Yeah, I guess you could. I just honestly chose not to because there's no reason to. Yeah. You know, I, I openly spoke about the Jessica Lynch op and some things that I thought were wrong or that that target that was the number one chem bio. So some of that, I don't even know if I should. And I actually feel a little uncomfortable talking about it, but there's nothing. I don't think dudes are going to kick in my door to arrest me right now. Right. But no, I, I try to. You know, I tried to stay away from all conversations like that, just as a generality, because, you know, it was a prior life. Um, if I'm with the right dudes that I was with that night, you know, we might reminisce over a beer and it might right. get a little bit into the weed. Right. But in general, there's just no reason to share sure. it at all. Right. You know, and I don't have anything against the movies and the TV shows. I guess if I had my choice, they would kind of go away. Um, I'm not writing a book because I don't think I would even read it. So, uh you know, it's just not my thing. But for those that choose to go that route, you know, kudos to you, I guess. Yeah. And, you know, and Jack and I have talked about this, you know, both on on the show and kind of between ourselves. And there are definitely different levels of OPSEC, right? There, there are things that you're going to share with your family that really your family has to know sometimes. Um, they might. Yeah. And honestly, I've got an adult son. I've never been married. My mom and my stepdad live in Florida. So my family was my dog. So, and he passed away last week. So, oh, you know, he nice. probably heard a lot of stories. But <laughs> yeah. He's my dog and my boy. So uh, that, I don't, I don't really have the traditional family. Yeah. You know, I've got a lot of really super close friends, um, but still, you know, sitting around my fire pit, drinking beers, that stuff just doesn't come up. Yeah. I mean, we, we there might be a questions every now and then, but yeah. Uh, I, I see no reason to go down that road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Cat Chaser, thank you again. Cheers. And David Vincent, thank you very much. Um, what makes a good seal? Oh, God. I mean, I think we talked about most of it. It's just they say Bud's is mostly mental and not that physical. I don't know if that's true because it's pretty physical as well. But Bud's doesn't make a seal either. That's just kind of a a six month glimpse of how, how bad things can be, you know, and I'll tell you what, since buds, I've been colder than I ever was in buds. I've been more tired, been more scared. I've been, you know, all those, it's just a, do you want to be here? And is this what you want to do? So right. I think, uh, you know, if you, if you line up 10 dudes that were seals, I think six of them, you would have never guessed because mm. now I'm 57 years old. I'm falling apart. I'm fat. You know, but you, you look at it and there's there's no body type that's like, oh, that guy's a, they're not all Greek gods. They're just dudes that will not quit and they're going to get the job done. Right. So, again, I, I just keep doing these run on tangents, run on sentences. But, no, you, yeah, there's there's no no simple answer to that at all. And, you know, and I, I don't remember if it was Mike. But I, don't, I don't remember who it was we spoke to about the RRDRC selection, but it is basically that thing. Anytime like buds or anytime you're going to a selection, it's like, that's the bare minimum. A, a, a day at work will be worse than that. And you can't quit. Like if you're doing a shipboarding or, or you're doing something out in the cold water on an op, you don't get to quit. So, right. so a selection is the bare minimum. Well said. And I, I completely, completely agree with everything you just said right there. So um, that's, do you want to, are you sure you want to be here? If not, there's a bell, you can go ring it and go on your Mary Navy way. But if you do and you tough it out, then, you know, the hills you're going to have to climb afterwards are legitimate and that you cannot, the, the option of ringing the bell on target or even in training just doesn't exist. Right. You're going to get somebody else hurt. Right. You know, you talked about some of the terrain in Afghanistan and SEALs don't have that sort of uh, overland movement selection. They, you know, their selection is based around water. But when you're 
three clicks off a target and two of those clicks are straight up and down, right? Right. You don't get to quit then. Absolutely. And, you know, there were years that we went without putting on a Drager, which is, I know you guys know, our rebreather and diving and doing traditional steel stuff. But after 9-11, you know, there, there wasn't a whole ton of water in Afghanistan <laughs> or Iraq. Um, yeah. And we were very. Uh, D, do we have any questions on Patreon? No, not that I've seen. Okay, great. So, uh, again, Nelson, thank you for spending some of your evening with us, man, on your vacation. Really appreciate it. Um, for the folks watching on Friday, we'll have Ward Carroll on, who is a former uh, F-14. F yeah. He's an F-14 guy? Yeah. Okay. So Ward was an F-14 dude. We're going to have him on the show on Friday. And um, we'll take it from there. So, yeah, Nelson, have a great rest of your vacation, man. Heading back to Tucson tomorrow. Again, thank you guys for your patience. I appreciate the conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. you're the man. Thank Everybody, you so much. Greatergood.org, drop them five bucks. It's nothing for you, right? And the link and will be in the description. And and pub. Yeah, the link will be the down below. Pub. Take, a, take a look. Take a look. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you, uh, Nelson. And uh, we'll see everyone on Thanks, Friday. Everybody.